Uh, my name is Zach Wood. I'm from Santa Monica Studio, and let me introduce our distinguished guest for this panel, which is the art and the art of uh, discovery and surprise in games. So here we have Kira Takahashi and Robin Haneke. Uh, they are both working in a new company called Phenomena, and they just announced their first game called Watam. If you didn't see it at the keynote today, they're going to show it at the end of their presentation. Most of you probably know Keda's previous work on Katamari Damacy and Nobi Nobi Boy, and Robin's previous work at that game company on Journey and previous to that at EA on The Sims. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Robin and Keda. Hi, guys. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate you taking some time away from all the games on the floor to come and listen to us talk. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what we've been doing at Phenomena. Um, Kata's game is our second title that we've announced. We have another game called Luna. And uh, mostly what we're going to be talking about is this idea of sort of where the idea of discovery and surprise comes from, particularly Kata's background. Um, we're really happy to be here today to show you our new project. We've been working on it for a while. Um, and as I said in the uh, presentation this morning, um, Kate and I met about 12 years ago, and this is what we look like. We were very gorgeous, and we had long hair. <laughs> very young. Um, he was working on Katamari Damacy, and uh, I was working at EA. Um, in some ways, uh, I think that it was our shared belief in the sort of positive and transformative power of games that brought us together and helped us meet. I kind of believe that that creative force uh, connects a lot of independent game developers in general, but it also had a little bit of something to do with this little guy right here. <laughs> so, um, before we met, I was actually studying computer science um, and teaching myself game design and game programming by participating in events like the Indie Game Jam. And this is a photo of me trying to figure out some sort of a problem that's <laughs> clearly stumping me. Um, and eventually, I left graduate school and went to work in games on The Sims. So I kind of moved from school into the games industry. Um, because I couldn't stay away. I just love games so much. And when I had the opportunity, I kind of jumped ship. Uh, and meanwhile, in Tokyo, Keda was going to art school and experimenting with a bunch of stuff, which he's going to tell you about in his presentation. And then eventually, he also jumped ship and ended up in video games as well. And when I went to Tokyo Game Show in like 2002 or 2003 and saw his uh, demo uh, in the Namco booth, I was like totally struck by it. And no one in the States had seen it yet. And I immediately knew that I wanted to meet him because I just thought the game was so joyful and so silly and also so cool to play. Um, and so we invited him to come and speak at the Game Developers Conference in, in California. And um, we had this special sort of focus session that looks at experimental games called the Experimental Gameplay Workshop. And I asked him to come and talk at it uh, because I wanted to show this work. And Kata gave this really brief but totally moving presentation about the sort of inspiration behind Katamari, which was this idea that the whole world needed to roll up into one big ball, and that we needed to be peaceful and love one another, and it was super great, and every, there wasn't a dry eye in the house after it was over. And people loved it so much, in fact, it got so much positive press that um, the game was actually translated into English, and they brought it here to the States. So um, Kate and I started collaborating and talking, and then he came back to GDC the following year, and it was awesome. He gave a talk at GDC, he won a design award, it was super cool, and I'm a huge fan, so I have a Katamari license plate, like I'm the biggest fan of Katamari in the universe. I've got all my Katamari t-shirts, I have Katamari ring, Katamari earrings, you know, everything. And, you know, I think at first I just was sort of beset Kata as a fan, but then over time, we would meet up at events and we would talk. Um, but my Japanese is really bad, so we didn't really talk. What we would do is we would like kind of talk out loud and then we would draw on a notebook and then we'd pass a notebook back and forth. Sometimes maybe have a beer. <laughs> it would help a little bit. Um, but we found that we had some same values. And we talked about these values and what we wanted to see in games as we kept getting older and growing as developers. And I worked on some games, and he worked on some games. And a lot of them were about physical play, joyfulness, 
um, they were very colorful and sort of celebrated childhood feelings um, because we think that those things are really important. And Kata also focused on working on some prototypes, uh, either physical games or games that were available um, on, like on iOS that you could play on your, on your iPhone, your iPad, um, to try and experiment with other ways of making things physical. Um, and all of those games are really great. Um, and I was spending my time working on this game about connection and creating genuine relationships between strangers online. Um, so that was pretty awesome. And eventually, after some talking and drawing and a little collaboration, we decided to work together on a new idea. Um, more specifically, Kata was at Baby Castles in New York uh, making it this exhibit of physical games where he met uh, our friend Vikram. And together, they started working on a prototype for Watam. And it was really fun. And we started talking about, well, what if we could actually make this game for real and like somebody would help us make it? We started meeting with people in Santa Monica and talking about it. And eventually, Kata and Vikram moved to San Francisco. Vikram moved from New York City, and Kata came over from Vancouver, where he had been living, to work together at Phenomena. And we're 13 people now, which is awesome. Um, back then, there was just four of us. <laughs> so. Um, as I said earlier, Kata, um, or rather Japanese is not my, it's not my native language and I really failed to learn it um, because I'm really slow and silly, but Kata is patient and he's also a genius and he actually taught himself English. So now you can hear a bit from him about his creative interests and the things that led to Watam and he's going to share some of the drawings that he has done over the years, which I think are really fantastic. So here we go. Uh, hi. Uh, so I will speak using my poor English. So if there is any part of what I say that you don't understand, please use your imagination. <laughs> so let me show you what I made and kind my perspective quickly. I made first and second Katamari Damasi. Stage of Sin Rule, Korogashi Makom, Katamari Damasi, Konoharu debut. Katamari Ball rolls up everything and gets bigger than anything you know in the real world. And I made Nobi Boy that gets longer and longer. It's simple and very silly game, but it took five years to develop. So I made something besides video game too. I designed some playground equipment stuff. I'll show you some design. This is a swing. Usually parents push kids sitting on the swing. But I thought it would be more fun to sit next to each other and enjoy the swings together. So I combine the swings together and seesaw, more longer seesaw <laughs> than you expected with ropes at the edge. And also I added a slide to it. So you can move the seesaw by pulling the ropes and you can use them to climb up to the seesaw. This is a giant climbing frame. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so dangerous, so. <laughs> I adjust the design so that the gaps between steps are within 10 feet. <laughs> the total height is still 40 feet, though. <laughs> 
slide. The park that was candidate for building playground has a very big slanting surface. I intend to create a wide slide there. It was a, uh, it's wide, so parents, children, and friends can slide together. You can also let animals and balls slide, and pouring water may be fun too. And I combined like a donuts inside of a normal linear slide. This should create new way of play by re removing entrance and exit. So if you imagine in the donuts-like shape, you can not only slide down, but also use it to climb up again. There's a risk of bumping into someone sliding down, <laughs> but it will also be fun trying to avoid it. <laughs> it's a game. <laughs> and for cleaning this slide, <laughs> a cleaning stuff covered in clothes, which looks like a mop, can slide down while turning. I hope it will become some sort of fun performance. Um, that this is a cut part to play with dogs. <laughs> so you can throw things very far using this, and your dog will be very, very happy. <laughs> How do you like this? <laughs> but. <laughs> but unfortunately, these look so dangerous. <laughs> But therefore, I guess it needs some restrictions for safety. <laughs> Maybe putting a restriction on yourself is to be an adult. <laughs> 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 However, I think there are some meaningless restrictions which people don't know the reasons for because they were established long ago in case of playground equipment you might be able to solve the problem of safety restriction with the latest technology. So thinking about common sense or restriction which are around you is maybe not a bad thing. We might be restricted without noticing or we might restrict ourselves. Actually, there are some new equipment design that do not just extend traditional design. That, 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 but I think the more interesting equipment just extends traditional one. I think this is evidence that traditional playground equipment are very excellent. And I wanted the people who played with it to feel this too. I wanted you to feel, wow, this is just bigger, just a bit longer than usual. What's up with that? <laughs> like in short, What's the point of having these restrictions that we have had all the time? Things we thought were obvious are not really obvious. This is what I'd like to use to think, because if you think like that, it will open possibilities in our daily life, our job, and in everything. This is an example. Usually, the white lines on the street are drawn straight, like this. But they aren't straight. So cool. <laughs> I like that. They actually bend and turn. I know the purpose of this bended line is make car be slow. But I think also this street makes people's everyday existence filled with enjoyment. You can get a very enjoyable feeling from simply walking along this wonky line. 
I didn't realize that we can make bended line because they had been drawn straight before I was born. That's all it takes. <laughs> I know children can feel these restrictions like what I felt about white line, so I hope that parents notice them and ensure it has a good impact on their kids. This is why I try to design playground for families to play, not just kids. Normally, parents just watch their kids or talk with other parents, but parents should stop talking <laughs> and play at the playground too, more like kids. Parents should play at playgrounds more than kids. But in the end, it was cancelled <laughs> for budget reason. <laughs> yeah, so stupid. <laughs> yeah, making playground from scratch is so expensive. Expensive than game development, I guess. <laughs> However, I could make use of these experiences for the next project. That was an event at New York and I try to combine gameplay and physical play to get more fun. It's called 3D Pac-Man. What if you can project game screen to all walls around you? Maybe you can feel I like you are standing inside of the game world. But actually, that is a um, very ordinary thought, and I didn't care about that. I know if you projected FPS game to all walls and ceiling, you might be so excited <laughs> because it feels like you have really joined that battle but I got bored with beating enemies, <laughs> also competing with someone. It's enough. I just wanted to tie walls and ceiling to actual gameplay. I mean, like, if, you, if your character goes to ceiling, you have to look up at it. If your character goes to side wall, you have to turn sideways. If your character goes far away, you have to come closer to it. It was a very simple experience, but also an obvious and very fresh experience for me. It won't happen if you play this video game on a TV. I know you might be able to experience similar feeling using VR stuff, but I don't like that. <laughs> They look a little bit too weird. <laughs> and I think this idea won't be used as a commercial game, definitely. <laughs> but it's still so fun. Especially, I like the idea even the corner of room and the curtain become obstacle. It's very smart. Also, I made a cool game named Tenya When Your Teens, but I will need more time to talk about that, so maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's almost all my C works so far. And I might be able to say all of my ideas come from the art college. I study sculpture there. I made a table that transform into robot. <laughs> it need two people to transform it. 
it's kind of the communication tool. <laughs> also, I made a flower pot in the shape of a goat. <laughs> the water should be drained through their boobs. <laughs> and I made a tissue box cover in the shape of a hippo. Like, why hippo? The hippo is called kaba in Japanese. So, kaba and kaba, kaba and kaba, kaba and kaba. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of joke. <laughs> um, like, surprisingly, I had seen many people who are laughing look at my silly stuff at college. So, I realized. Oh, funny stuff makes people smile. Smiling is better than sad or crying. <laughs> However, people cannot experience it easily if it exists as an art. Because sculpture or art are put in museum or galleries in general. But if it exists as ordinary stuff, like a flower pot or a table, it might be create fun in our daily lives. The reason I got into the video game industry is the same. I thought it's one of a few jobs that is creating something fun and something familiar to people in various countries. So my dream is to be a billionaire by selling my new CD game, Watan, and to make public dangerous playground to all over the world <laughs> by my stupid money. <laughs> Thank you, Kata. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's a really admirable dream. Maybe next year at PSX we can have a custom playground for all the guests. Do you think that anybody would play it? Yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd have to sign a waiver. <laughs> so as we mentioned in the keynote, the idea for Watam actually came to Kato while he was playing with his son, Wow, when Wow was about two years old. Um, this was, uh, we had both been working in Vancouver and we're talking about maybe what Kato would do next. And um, in many ways, um, he's you know, made a game about a prince and a king, and then he made a game about a boy and a girl, and so the question was, well, what's this game gonna be about? So it's gonna be about the mayor and the deputies. And that's really all that we've said so far about the game. We showed you the mayor today, and you'll see him at the end of the presentation. But while he was busy designing the game and prototyping it with Vikram, I had to design a company and get us ready to be able to make this game. And that company is called Phenomena. Um, and we designed it with the explicit goal of bringing games like Kata's to life. As he pointed out, sometimes things get canceled for sad reasons, um, maybe even stupid reasons. And we wanted to make sure that this game would get made, and be made in a way with people that we really respected. And that's how we ended up partnering with Santa Monica and Sony. Um, I had a relationship with them a long, long time ago. Um, I worked on a game called Journey with Martin, my co-founder. And um, he also helped make Flow and Flower. And I think if you look at the sort of pedigree of the games that have been released on PSN from independent developers, you see that they support the idea of making things for fun, for people, things that people can play together in new and joyful ways. Um, and our company specifically is trying to do that in a way that allows it not just to be fun and creative in terms of your playful experience uh, on the consumer end, but also for us, like we want to make games in a way that's fun so we can work together and not kill ourselves and sustainable and it feels good to go to work every day, not crunch, that kind of stuff. This is all of us <laughs> right now. Um, we're just climbing on the um, advertising platform on the roof of Phenomena, <laughs> which is probably not super safe. But um, we really believe that games about curiosity and creativity and exploration um, have a value and that they add this quality of surprise and joy to the world and that's something that we really want to do. And we want to make games that are surprising but not in the like shocking sort of loud booms and explosions way but maybe in similar ways like maybe these ideas of being able to figure out what's working, how it works, what's going to happen, 
they can be used in different ways in the games that we make. And if you think about the ideas in Cadis Playground, this idea of building a giant version of something and then experiencing it from a different scale, or building something that normally is very easy to do, making it very difficult to do, like taking the Pac-Man game and making you look all around, that's about transforming your experience of something you already know. And that feeling is usually very joyful because it makes you see the world in a different way. And we are really enjoying working together on this game. Uh, it's silly, and it starts with a bang. And we're going to sort of explain more about the game throughout the year. Um, we're shy about talking about the game right now because it's still early in development. But Kata did want to say a few things about the trailer. So he's going to take over now. Uh, let me talk about our new game briefly. But I really don't like to talk <laughs> or show things that are not finished yet. But I have to, <laughs> because I'm here. <laughs> uh, so maybe a few people already watched Watan Teaser, but let me show you it again. Uh, so this is original sketch of teaser that I wrote. Uh, you can see some small differences, but it's almost same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I miss Chef Hart. So, so my whistle is, doesn't work. <laughs> In the initial plan, Mayor's heart was dropped off when it hit the wall, but the door that I made was so high for the mayor, so we changed the plan. I forgot the A between T and M. Yeah, as I mentioned about Watan earlier today, this game idea came to me while I played Brock with my son. He was two years old then. Then I had to draw something quickly before I forgot this idea. Looks like all Brock's people come alive and that might be fun. That is everything I would love to share about Watan so <laughs> Sorry, but I think I can show more next year, maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> if we can convince you, maybe. So yeah, um, we're really excited to be working on this game, but especially to be able to talk about it now with you in public. Um, as you all know, Kata has a real sense of surprise and whimsy, so I'm sure you can look forward to hearing more about it in interesting and unexpected ways as we go into 2015. Um, even if it's just a little bit at a time, because we want you to experience the fun of it yourselves when it actually ships. 
But we hope that as we reveal more about it, that you also start to fall in love with it and that it becomes something that really gives you joy even as we unveil it. So with that, we will say thank you and take questions. No, okay, doesn't answer the question. It's totally fine. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm going to Vancouver on Friday to see my favorite band of all time, Mother Mother, all right. there in Vancouver. I wanted to ask, what should I eat while I'm there? Oh, that's a good question. What did we like to eat when we were in Vancouver? You, you, there's really good Japanese food there. What's the name yeah, of that place? There are many nice ramen places there. You should go Santoka Ramen. Yeah, Santoka. <laughs> Santoka? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really like the idea about the playground equipment, and I'm wondering if you've ever considered uh, crowdfunding, because your presentation <laughs> was very compelling. You know, that, that, that has come up. Um, Kata, do you think you would ever do like a Kickstarter for a giant playground? It would, it would have to be a lot of money. Like a lot. Yeah. And, right. and then where would we put it? I mean, Switzerland maybe? So everybody could use it. I mean, that's, it's kind of hard, but. Yeah. Uh, so I try to make a playground with uh, Nottingham in yeah. the UK people, but they said, uh, making uh, playground stuff from the scratch will take at least a million. <laughs> a million UK. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know <laughs> how do I get such a big deal by using Kickstarter? <laughs> Maybe people would do it. I don't know. It's a mystery. It's a mystery to us whether or not that would get funded. I certainly would pitch in. Yeah, I get my five bucks. I mean, it could be cool. Maybe if it was a traveling one, like a travel around on the back of a truck, and then people could come and play it. That would be kind of cool. And then you could take it all over the place or like chopper lift it into some place where people don't usually use playgrounds, like in Bhutan or something. That would be cool. Next question. Oh, it's you. Oh, OK. Uh, first, I want to thank you for a very um, intriguing, very funny <laughs> presentation. That's fantastic. Uh, my question is, I was really struck by the level of creativity that you both had. And when I ask how these ideas come to you, do they just appear at a bolt, a bolt of lightning? Or is it a process of constant refinement? So you can talk a bit about how the creati creativity process works for you both. He asked, um, he said that we're both very creative, which is very nice. Thank you. Um, and that he was wondering how creative ideas come to our minds. Like, do they just pop in? Or do we think really hard? You know? So. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I couldn't explain inside of my brain. <laughs> Maybe I don't like to speak with people, <laughs> so I could think more deeply than other guys. <laughs> Maybe I did come from there. <laughs> Not sure. Yeah, so Keita, Keita sometimes refers to himself as a bit of, of a grouch or a little bit antisocial. He really does enjoy working, um, doesn't necessarily enjoy small talk, chit chat, like me. So I'm super social, I'm the opposite of Keita. Um, I love talking and making silly sounds. And in fact, actually, Kata's nickname for me is Noisy. <laughs> so he once gave me a chew toy so that I could put in my mouth during meetings so I wouldn't interrupt people. <laughs> so um, my process is very different than his. Um, I like to talk to people about crazy things and experiences in my life, and then those become game ideas. So for the other game that we're working on, Luna, 
Um, I made it after going through a kind of a rough period in my own personal life and talking to a lot of people about transformation and what makes, what makes a bad experience into a positive part of yourself. Um, so for me, the designs come from feelings, and I think for Kata, they come from feelings, but um, I express those feelings outward and then take a lot of feedback and try to turn that into something that everyone on the team can relate to and has a voice in. And I think Kata thinks for a long time, and then he draws pictures, and then we all just have all these ideas, and that come, they come out. So he inspires us in many ways by really concentrating his ideas down into drawings and, and f frameworks, um, whereas I am much more casual. Um, but in both cases, I think we probably have a pretty weird head on the inside. What games are you guys excited about? Oh, I'm really excited to play The Witness. I can't wait. I'm super excited about that. And there actually, there are a ton of indie titles um, on the floor here that I'm going to go and play tomorrow. So um, I'm super excited about that. Kata was enjoying Hohokam. Do you have anything that you're looking forward to right now? Uh, no. no, I think he's focused on the game. Uh, what was the first oh. game you ever played? <laughs> or what got you interested in gaming? OK. Katie, you, you can talk a little bit about your, what was the first game you played or what got you interested in making video games? He has a lot of video games and a lot of toys. He has a huge, cool toy collection. Like, you have all those old ones. She said, yeah, video game, first video game you played. Mm, I forgot. Maybe Famicom? Yeah, probably, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. What would it have been? Baseball? Um. We're old. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. I forgot. Well, so what got you into making video games? Like, how'd that happen? You were in art school, and then you started making video games? You just, like, rolled up to Namco and were like, hey, yo, I'm going to make video games. How'd that work? Roughly, uh, I like to make something. Like I like to make a sculpture. I like to draw something. But for me, to make something is really useful <laughs> for our world because I like the sculpture. But in the art college, students try to make. A Art, <laughs> but after that we threw away. <laughs> um, I thought, "Wow, that's really." They throw away stuff that they made. Um, so I was thinking, "What is art, or um, what I want to do?" Then, so I try to make a, like a tool, like a table, like a flower pot, and teach box cover. That is a tool, so you can use in your daily lives. It's not, doesn't need to throw away. Yeah, it's not just for show. It's something that you can use as a tool. Yes. Um, as I mentioned in that presentation, I tried to make uh, something silly. But I'm so glad, I was so glad the people makes, uh, my silly stuff makes people smile. But I also, I noticed they are still useless, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, like, my thought is kind of extreme, <laughs> right? If there is a, something that ranking about the job, that maybe agriculture people or food people is the highest, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the artist or making sculpture or 
It's very low priority, right? <laughs> we don't need it. Not to survive. Yeah. Mm. But I like to make something fun. So I found the game industry. <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Smells like similar <laughs> with art or what I'm doing right now. Game industry provide fun, but also it's kind of useless. <laughs> <laughs> yes, So maybe of course. Le maybe a little less useless than the stuff and from before. And very luxury. <laughs> luxury, yeah. <laughs> Need uh, electricity and comfortable temperature. <laughs> um, TV, big TV, nice audio. But better than a gallery. I mean, you don't have to pay to go see it. Once you buy it, you can play it whenever you want. Yeah. So I'm, mm, I'm not still uh, find out what I should I do. Yeah. For, mm, for me or for the us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the reason is something like that. Very, <laughs> very simple. <laughs> I think it's a pretty good reason. <laughs> so, any other questions? Here we go. Raucous applause from behind us on stage. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, because you talk about um, you know, finding happiness in the small things, and all the games are about surprises and things like that. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered, um, or have you ever even thought about making online games where, mm. the goal, where there is no goal or there is no... You know, it's not like a combat game or something, but a game where you can just go in with friends or strangers and interact and kind of create happiness and experiences out of that. Yeah, actually, Kata and I worked together a little bit on a game that was sort of like that called Glitch. Unfortunately, it didn't end up, it shipped, but it didn't, it got canceled, so it got stopped. But Kata um, actually lured me up to Vancouver to go and work on it for about six months, um, right towards the end of its production cycle. And I think one of the things that we really liked about Glitch um, was that it was supposed to be exactly that. It was supposed to be an online place where you could go and hang out with friends. And you could grind and do kind of like crafting and like farming and things like this. But Kata actually, uh, when he was there, he made a list of ideas, which he would have silly ideas, he called them, stupid idea. And he would make little animated pictures for them and send them out to the team. And like there are over a hundred. They were really cool. Like, one of them was a train station, but it was like a giant dinosaur. You go in the butt and you come out the mouth. You know, maybe you have to go through the intestines to get somewhere and just stuff like that. Crazy game ideas. Um, so yeah, we've we certainly thought about that. You know, what would that be like? Um, a lot of the things that Kata does are so interesting, and um, if we could figure out ways to get people to sponsor them, like the playground is a perfect example, or a game made out of those things is another example, um, in a way that would be sustainable for us, um, that would be great. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, go on. Oh, uh, when you design, like, when you say you have a silly, or what you consider a silly idea, do you decide its function first, or do you decide form? Mm. Or... Yeah. He said, when you have a silly idea, do you decide function first, or form? Uh, it's usually a drawing, right? Both. <laughs> both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> he does a lot of doodling. I mean, even the new logo, it sort of came from a doodle that he did. We were talking about phenomena, and he said, you know, it's just like an F, and then it just goes forever. <laughs> that, was his, that was his inspiration. Um, so it's kind of like a system, like it's loops, and like it'll probably devolve over time into spirograph and other things. Maybe it'll turn to a stretchy Nobu boy, who knows. But um, these are... I don't know. It, yeah, it's like drawing and talking together about both what it needs to do, but also I think what it could do. A lot of times Kata will ask why. Like we'll be having a conversation about something and he'll go, but why? Why like that? And that's like I think what he was saying in the presentation, right? Like if you ask yourself why are you thinking this way, usually it's because there's some kind of a constraint uh, on your thinking 
that like the white lines on the side of the road, you've always seen them that way, so you don't think about writing on curvy roads and you don't think about designing curvy spaces unless you're someone who's really trying, like say an artist. Um, you're not gonna think that way. And I think Keita often asks, why are you thinking that or why are you suggesting that? In fact, I think sometimes I take a sort of sick pleasure in suggesting the most obvious producery dis sort of idea in a design discussion to make his face do this. <laughs> because then he starts to explain why that idea is too conventional and that idea is not gonna make the game more cool or more interesting or give it more texture. And so a lot of the best ideas are almost in reaction to the first thing that comes to your mind. Like, well, what if this? And he goes, oh, that's so boring, you know? And in a way, that's exactly what makes, I think it, it's what makes the game different, is because every time we have the boring idea, Kate is always there to sort of say, oh, we can do better than that. We can get outside of that frame of reference, um, which is pretty funny sometimes. <laughs> Some of the stuff that we end up doing is really silly, but it makes you laugh so much. And now I think people feel comfortable sort of suggesting silly things, much more so than when we first started working on it. Um, so it's just going to get sillier. <laughs> It'll be very silly. So we have six more minutes. <laughs> You're making him work for his kibbles and bits here. <laughs> so um, there's, a, there's a book out there called um, A Fun Theory of Game Design mm -hmm. by Ralph Koster. Yeah, have you read it? He, Ralph is amazing. Yes, he's, yes. he's a friend. He talks about how games are kind of tools of learning and um, that the games we use now, they, they teach us kind of primitive skills like how to throw, how to you know, have a little tribe. Have you thought about making your games, they're kind of like toys for, for kids, teach very complex themes like economy or climate or things like that. Mm. I think it would be perfect. Your, what you're, you have, your setup, would be perfect to bring those abstract ideas down to a manageable level. Well, so I think there's two ways to answer that question. Um, the first is that um, Phenomena does work on a couple of things that are nonprofit uh, with universities. Um, one of them is a game that you play uh, with data from a Fitbit, and it's designed so that kids can explore the surface of this foreign planet using the energy that's generated by their steps. And the goal of the gameplay itself, like the concrete gameplay, is exploration and terraforming the planet. It's called Terra. But um, the systems that it's trying to teach are actually, they're trying to teach you to get out of your frame of reference about activity and the way that you move each day. So there's that kind of work that we do. Um, but I would say that for Watam, the, it's more simple. Like the systems are usually, we would do the opposite. So instead of thinking about really complex mental systems in the game, we would think a lot more about physical things and like, like, like on a playground, say. Um, that joyful climbing of like that giant climbing frame. Like imagine how cool it would feel to be climbing something that big with a bunch of other kids and then you'd get about halfway up and then it would start to get scary, right? But then as you kept going, you would start to feel really good about yourself because you were pushing yourself. And eventually, if you got to the top, you would feel really masterful. And then you have to come back down. And that's all like in just the shape and your experience of that shape. And in fact, actually, Kate and I were playing with WoW on a playground that has a big like Spider-Man rope cage. And he really wanted to go up. And so we helped him all the way up to the top. And Kate was sitting up there waiting for him, and we were pushing him up, pushing him up, and he finally got to the top. And the last couple of steps, he was like so freaked out <laughs> that he was gonna fall. But because Kate was up there, he was like, come on, come on, and eventually got up there. And then he got up there and just, he held on to Kate so tight. He was so scared. But then we helped him down through the, through the middle. There's like a pole, and he slid down the pole, and he was just so ecstatic. When he got back down to the ground, he was like three times as energized running around, like his battery just got totally recharged. So I think we try, in this game, we try to focus on that kind of feeling that you can be transformed by a simple encounter that takes you back to your child self and gives you the opportunity to feel those kinds of changes even as you play it. So it's not so complicated, 
but it does reset the way that you think, um, if that makes any sense. Would you like to add anything to that, Kata? I didn't think so. <laughs> Three more minutes. <laughs> any more questions? No? Can I the robot table? What now? The robot table? Robot table, what about it? Oh, you want to buy it. Um, it's living in Kata's parents' uh, attic, I think, right now. Um, you might have to fight with some other people for that. I, I don't think we're going to offer that one up for sale right now. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> that is not a bad idea. In your spare time, Kata, between raising two kids and making this wonderful game, you should do that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, well, we really appreciated you all coming out to listen to us talk about our silly creativity. And we've got one more. <laughs> Hello. Hi there. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on um, player mechanic to uh, interact with the world. Like, I feel like we're in a place in gaming where there's a lot of explosions and shooting and whatnot. Uh, yes. And I noticed that you, your games are not like that. So I'm wondering if you have any, any like, uh, can you just go from there? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think th the temptation would be to say stuff that was really negative about the fact that there are so many games that are focused on the same thing. Um, we've certainly had that conversation that it's kind of just boring, like Kato was saying, I'm kind of over um, competing with people or like beating enemies per se. But we also kind of still like it. There's something about the idea of like beating a boss monster that's really cool. Um, and the experience could be cool, maybe. Um, it's just about seeing it, like we said, from a different perspective. So it's not good to say never. It's not good to say no. It's better to say what if. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You never know what um, what's something might turn into when you start, and when you say, I'll never do this, um, then later it turns out that you kind of want to. So there's, it's more about seeing the possibility and the mechanics that exist, but also looking past them to, to new things. Um, and because Kate is so difficult to impress, um, it, it's important that, you know, it's true, he's picky, but that pickiness leads to seeing things differently. Um, and it's a gift to see things differently, at least I think so. So if anything, we, I mean, I don't know. I can't, you can't say that we would hope that people would see things differently. It's <laughs> too hard to say that. But, um, but that's certainly the kind of thing that we think about. And with that, Thanks. we have gone 36 seconds over our official time. So yeah. thank you, Kata, for your time today. <laughs> PlayStation.